Welcome to Bible Study at St. Paul Lutheran Church and School in Boca Raton, Florida. This is Revelation 21, part of our obviously continuing series on the book of Revelation. And I am Vicar Josh. Uh, I've been teaching the class. So I'll continue to teach the class, I guess, for this week and next week because Revelation has 22 chapters. So, getting into this chapter, introducing this chapter a little bit. This chapter is pretty straightforward, especially as far as chapters in Revelation go. It's a vision of heaven. It's a vision of the new creation. It's a vision of the joy that comes after everything we've seen so far. All of the trials, all of the judgment, all of the, the agony, I guess, of this world struggling with sin and struggling um, in a broken relationship with God. And we're seeing what comes after Jesus' final victory here. And as a result, this is this is going to be probably a pretty quick video. This is going to be pretty short um, because there's it's really at its core. This chapter is just a description of the incredible beauty of the new creation. So that's what we're going to step into. Um, and we're going to start with, with a pretty large chunk of text. We're going to start with the first eight verses as we dive into the text of Revelation. And as always, I encourage you, go ahead and grab your Bible, um, whether that be a physical Bible or, again, on your phone. Um, I don't care. Well, yeah, no, I don't care. As long as you have a Bible, whatever floats your boat. Um because as always I'll have the text up here but then also as I walk through it might be helpful for you to be able to like look at your text and say oh I see where he's referencing oh I see what he's talking about um, so that's what we have before us and as we step forward as I said we're going to go through verses 1 through 8 and they say then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And that is our text. So as we see from the beginning, we have a description here of the new creation. Um, this is the idea of a new creation is referenced pretty specifically in Isaiah and second Peter. It's, it's directly mentioned as a new creation after Jesus second coming. And it's referenced indirectly also in Luke and Corinthians. So this is a consistent reality. This description that the world isn't just going to be like slightly modified or just changed a little bit, the, the creation is going to be brand new. Um, which is something that I think can be a struggle because there's some unfamiliarity with that. There's, there's something scary with something that is completely new. Um, but as we walk forward in this text, there's a promise of how incredible it, it is. So, as we walk forward, it then says, the sea was no more. And you might say, well, that's weird. Um, and there are two typical understandings of this. 
of this reality of the new creation. The first is um, the obvious interpretation of, of literal bodies of water. And the suggestion is then made that in heaven there will be no lakes or seas or oceans or <clears throat> however you want to term that. Um, I don't know if that's a, a good understanding. I don't know if that's uh, appropriate or consistent because the alternative is <clears throat> consistent with how Revelation has spoken in the past of the sea. In that when, when John is viewing the throne of God, he views the sea and the sea is like glass. Because throughout the scriptures, um, the ocean is used kind of symbolically as this element of chaos. And in Revelation, it's used as this element of chaos that has come between God and man. So I think it's more likely that when it says there is no sea, it's talking more to that element of chaos, the symbolic gap and boundary and, and chasm between man and God has been uh, erased. It is no more. Um, and I think that's probably a better way to understand this. So, and then we walk forward into the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming, um, coming down out of heaven from God. This is not a resurrection of the historic city. This is something new coming from God, adorned as a bride, <clears throat> where God is dwelling. So, um, I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent, and as those of you, especially who are in my in-person class so many weeks ago, um, I do have a tendency to go on tangents, but most of them are intentional. And that's why I announced that I'm going on a tangent before I go on it, just so you know that I am self-aware that I'm departing a little bit from the topic at hand. <clears throat> but there's, there's this problem in a lot of uh, people's understanding of the world, actually, of, of especially of theology. And um, I, don't, I don't know that it's really a heresy, I, I think, I'm sure someone somewhere has called or would call it a heresy, but I, I just, it's probably better described as a faulty ideology called uh, Represtinianism. And if we break that word down, re is like, go back or return, like, it has that prefix, and then the, the root word is pristine. So we have Represtinianism is a desire to return to a time when things were perfect or more ideal. And this is something that you see a lot with people in the church. They want to go back to what the church was uh, a decade ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago or a thousand years ago. And they say the church was better then. And no. It wasn't ideal then. It wasn't better. That the, the problems it faced might have been different ones. But at any period in time, the, the church and the world is distant from God. And in the eyes of God, that brokenness is, it's all the same. So there is that reality. And um, not only does it happen in the church, it happens in society too. Um People are like, oh man, I wish we were back in the society of the, of again, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, and saying, oh, that was better. I wasn't alive, so I can't confirm with firsthand knowledge, but in reality, um, there's been a struggle with society as long as society has existed, as long as humanity has been fallen. Um, so, like I said, a little bit of a tangent, but as I see, there's this idea of people are like, oh, it's just going to be a resurrection of, of what was, of the historic city of Jerusalem. No, this is something new. This is something perfect and without any flaws or any shortcomings. So, and we see that because in this new Jerusalem, God lives with his people. This is his actual personal presence with his people. And in the midst of that, there can be no sadness. There can only be joy. 
God has taken away any possible reason for sorrow or sadness. So, and that's what we see in verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eye. Death shall be no more, no mourning, no crying, nor pain. Because, and it's, it's pretty intentional here that God is taking them away. He's wiping the tears. So, we have that going on. And then it speaks to the... Or, it reads... The one on the throne speaks, and it says, Behold, I'm making all things new. This speaks more to what we've been speaking of. And then it talks about how there is there is no more struggle. Um, God is, everything is resolved. It is done, is what is said here. It is done. There is no more work to be done. There's no more, um, there's no more salvation. There's no more mission. There's no, like, it's done. God's work has been finished. And then it goes into this, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And this speaks to the fact that God is all-encompassing, that God is everything. So when he says it is done, he is the authority on whether or not it is done. Um... And then finally, in these verses, we go into blessings and judgment. It talks about, To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life. Uh, the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God. Um, as in the rest of Revelation, when it says he who conquers, it's, it's speaking about those who persevere in the faith, who keep the faith. Again, this isn't about what we do. This isn't about our actions. This is about faith. And it is simple as that, it is as easy as that, but at the same time, it is as difficult as that. And what it's speaking to, I will be his God, and he will be my son, this is speaking to a lasting, permanent relationship with God. And then it briefly mentions the flip side of that, but for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, um, this, this isn't speaking of cowards as an insult, like calling someone a coward. This is literally people without bravery, without the perseverance in the faith that is just talked about with those who are conquerors. These are people whose faith has been overwhelmed or never existed in the first place. And that lack of faith reflects itself in their actions. So when it talks about the murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars, it's not saying that those acts sent them to hell. Their lack of faith is what sent them to hell, which is what it's talking about here with the second death. And their lack of faith manifested itself in these things because a faithful follower of Christ follows Christ, does their best, and are they going to fall? Yes. But they're not defined by that. They're defined by their relationship to Christ. So that's what we have here. And then we're, we walk straight forward into that new Jerusalem, the city that it's talking about here, in verses 9 through 14. And the text we have before us is this. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. At a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates were the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So, um, before I get, I guess, into further details, a couple details I just want to pull out. Um, when it's talking about the bride, the wife of the Lamb, that is the church. When it's talking about um, the twelve apostles of the Lamb, these are the apostles of Jesus Christ. So... Just a couple really quick details there, and as we get into it, <clears throat> he 
we're talking about the bride of Christ here. Jerusalem, this is the city of the faithful, and it is the church, and it is the church adorned with glory. And then it speaks to this wall, and it kind of speaks with some, some length on this wall. This wall is representative of God's care and protection. Could it be a literal wall? Yes. As I've said before, who am I to speak? What elements are purely metaphorical and what elements are literal? But what we take that as is it is God's care and protection for the rest of of time um forever for eternity and what this prom this is a promise this is a promise that god's faithful people will never again suffer attacks or be afflicted so once this new creation has come there god wipes away every tear from our eyes and there never again is another reason for tears um, and it speaks to the, tw the, the wall of the city had 12 foundations and those were the 12 apostles, which is, is a reality. The church rests on the first proclaimers of the gospel. So that's kind of this introduction into the holy city. And then in the next six verses, we see a pretty, uh, or a much more specific description of that. And we're going to see that as we step forward because it says, and the one who had spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, 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 the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophrase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the streets of the city were pure gold like transparent glass. Whew! So, um, I don't have a ton of details on this section. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with ancient measurement systems, the dimension, the 12,000 stadia, um, that's roughly 13,080 miles square. Which again, for context, if you were to take the map of America um, and I guess draw like a square in it, like if this, if I should have had a graphic for this, is what I should have done. This is the map of America. You draw like a square. I have a square. And you draw like a square. That's about how big this city is. Um, so. This is a massive city we're talking about. Whether or not that's a literal measurement, I mean, the point it's getting at is that this is a massive city. It would take up most of the landmass of the United States of America. Um, and then it speaks to all these jewels that are in, in the walls. And what's interesting is that while they don't really have a ton of individual meaning, these are reflective of the ones that are in God's throne in Revelation 4 which speaks more toward the city as God's throne, the city as God's dwelling place. So that's what we see here in the more, I guess, specific uh, description of the New Jerusalem. And then we get to the more details about the city as we go forward into Revelation. Huh. It appears that I'm missing that slide. In Revelation 21... 22 to 27 here's what it says it says i saw no temple in the city for its temple is the lord god the almighty and the lamb and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of the lord of god gives it light and its lamp is the lamb by its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory to it and its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring it into it the glory and honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. 
So that's where we close this chapter. Um, and that's what we see here at the end of Revelation 21. And what we see here is God radiant and glorified in the city. All of creation worships our new God and evil and sin have no presence. So that's where we're left. We're left with this beautiful city. And this is the new creation that you and I all will have the joy of being a part of. It's a beautiful city. It's a city protected and cared for by God, where God walks among us and walks beside us directly, personally. And there is no space, no allowance for evil or sin or affliction or suffering for God's people. And that's what we see here in Revelation 21. And as I told you, it's a pretty quick chapter because it's just an awesome promise. And that's what we have before us. And next week we, we get it more of an awesome promise because we're going to look at the garden being restored. So that's what we have to look forward to next week. I, I hope this was helpful. The last thing I have for you is, as always, if you have any lingering questions or comments or concerns, please post them below in the comments. Or if you're not comfortable with that, you can always reach out to me personally. I It is literally my favorite thing to ask it answer questions about the Bible or about theology or about God. Um, it's, I, I genuinely enjoy doing it. So if you have any questions, please reach out to me, whether it be in the comments or to me personally. Um, so that is Revelation 21. Next week will be the last chapter, Revelation 22. And what I would encourage you to do uh, is if you check out in the corners here of this video, what you're going to see is a link um, to the to the Revelation playlist um, until it links to the next video, but also a button to subscribe to St. Paul's YouTube channel. And I would encourage you to do that because this isn't the only thing on the YouTube channel. There are playlists for uh, our podcast. There are playlists for Pastor Andrew's um Bible study series on the fundamentals of faith, the foundations of our faith, um, live worship, chapel services for the kiddos, Pastor Steve's daily devotions. There's a ton of stuff to help you get into the Word, to help you understand the Word more, especially during this time where we're a little more socially distant. Um, so I'd encourage you to subscribe to that page and um, be edified in that way. So you can do that via the button in the top corner or the button below this video. So with that, brothers and sisters, I would say go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.